Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Science Cafe. Uh, we're all cozy and dry inside tonight. Even though I was expecting it to be pouring rain outside, it is a lovely evening. Maybe we should all just move out there. Uh, but, uh, but it's great to see everybody here tonight. Um, thank you for coming. I know sometimes... Uh, Rain is a deterrent for Tucsonans, so we're happy that you made it out. Um, and we're delighted to uh, have our speaker tonight. But before I introduce her, for those of you who may not have heard this over and over again because you come to a lot of science cafes, my name is Shepard Reed, and I'm from the Flandreau Science Center and Planetarium at the University of Arizona. We have great exhibits, including a sharks exhibit and a sharks planetarium show right now. So if you're not getting enough ocean science through our cafe series, you can always come to Flandro or bring the kids or bring the grandkids. Uh, we've got a lot going on. And soon we will have our holiday planetarium shows to look forward to. Um, and with that, I am very pleased this evening to introduce our speaker, uh, Lynn Massey. And she is a fisheries biologist for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. She works to develop fisheries regulations for coastal fish species, and she co-leads a sea turtle ecology and a conservation project. I'm realizing we need to get the music off. Oh, good. Thank you. And... Going to keep going here. Very impressive. Um, and she earned both her BS and MS degrees in environmental science from the University of Arizona, and an MAS degree in marine biodiversity and conservation from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Please give a big, warm welcome to Lynn Massey. Thank you, Shepard. How does my mic work? Can everybody hear me? Too loud? Too soft? Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sh Sh Shepard. He just did my first three PowerPoint slides for me. Uh, my name is Lynn Massey. I'm a fishery management specialist at uh, the National Marine Fishery Service, which is an office that sits under the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. That is a ton of words. So what I'm going to do is refer to my agency by its public name, which is NOAA Fisheries. Uh, I'm about to pack a ton of information into 30 minutes, so there is time for questions at the end, uh, but if you have a burning question, feel free to raise your hand and Shepard will get to you with a microphone. Um, so I live in California, I live in, in Long Beach and work out of there, but I'm actually from Tucson, Arizona. I went to the University of Arizona for seven years. I was in the soil, water, and environmental science department. Uh, this is me with my lab. I worked in microbial, microbial ecology. Um, I was in that cohort of kids at U of A that's interested in marine biology, but we're landlocked here in Tucson at U of A, and we desperately take the four classes available to us, um, pushing for U of A to get a, a major in marine biology at least someday. Um, after I graduated from U of A, I moved to California for a job that I ended up hating, uh, and then I ended up going back to school at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, there's a picture of uh, me counting algae stipes, and here's a picture of me totally distracted from that assignment because I found a sea hair. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is I'm going to give you an overview of uh, what NOAA is and what the National Marine Fisheries Service does. Uh, after that, I'm going to describe the unique ecosystem that we have here off our west coast called the California Current Large Marine Ecosystem. Uh, after that, I'm going to give you a 30,000 foot view of how the United States manages our fisheries. And then last, I'll get into some really controversial conservation topics that we have here off our west coast that you've probably heard about in the news. Um, and then we'll end with a Q&A. Um, so just to give you a brief idea of where the fishery service sits in the government, NOAA is an office under the Department of Commerce, and then the fishery service, boxed here in red, is one of the line offices at NOAA. Um, you'll probably notice that we've got the National Weather Service on here. Anytime you mention NOAA, everyone's like, oh yeah, the fishery, or oh yeah, the weather service. So the weather service always steals our thunder, 
uh, but know that NOAA has a lot, a lot of other activity under it. There's also the National Ocean Service that does your ocean mapping and coral reef research. Uh, there's the Marine Aviation Office. Uh, those are the, the heroes that go fly around the edge of a hurricane and help with weather mapping. Um, so there's NOAA fisheries locations all over the country. Depends uh, what water body they're near. But I work for West Coast Region. Uh, so this is all fisheries that are off the coast of Washington, Oregon, and California. Um, you'll notice that Idaho is shaded too. That's because we manage salmon fisheries that actually travel to inland rivers in the Snake River watershed of Idaho. Um, I typically hate reading mission statements because I find them jargony and abstract, but I actually really love ours. And that is, NOAA Fisheries is responsible for the stewardship of the nation's ocean resources and their habitats. We provide vital services for the nation, productive and sustainable fisheries, safe sources of seafood, the recovery and conservation of protected resources and healthy ecosystems, all backed by sound science and an ecosystem-based approach to management. So, to boil that down into a bit more concrete list of ideas, we essentially do a lot of this list of things. Um, one is that we count fish, and that's really hard to do because fish are underwater and they move. Um, when I say we count fish, I don't mean it's somebody perched on the edge of a boat with a clipboard, like one, two. Um, it's a lot more than that. Um, we have multi-million dollar acoustic equipment that we mount on the hull of large research vessels, and they go out and they do transects along the coast, and they scan the stocks of fish. And when we get that information back from those research vessels, we then have to set harvest limits for our fishermen. <laughs> the idea is that we set them low enough so that any fish of a particular stock can sustainably replenish itself every year. So that's part of our duty, is just setting those sustainable harvest limits. Um, we also do a lot of habitat restoration. The primary example of this is salmon. Uh, we have a lot of uh, river passage that we have to rebuild and renew off the west coast, on the west coast. Uh, we also protect species. So for any animal that comes into contact with fisheries gear, like say a, a whale or a sea turtle, we have to put management measures in place to protect them and minimize those interactions as much as possible. Um, we do a ton of research. Um, we have huge teams of scientists that are dedicated just to research and publishing new information in journals every year. Lastly, we enforce the law. So we have an entire Office of Law Enforcement that patrols United States water, uh, and they're real officers that can arrest fishermen and put them in jail if they violate the law. Um, so where do we do this? I mentioned United States waters. Um, what you're seeing on this map here, there's this blue shaded area along the coast. Um, that's called the United States Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ. The United States has jurisdiction from three to 200 nautical miles off our coast. That's considered federal waters. Um, states have jurisdiction three miles and inward. So all the fisheries that we manage take place in these blue shaded areas. For me specifically, in the fisheries that I'll talk to you about today, uh, we're talking about this area right here, inside 200 nautical miles off our coast. Beyond that blue shaded area is called the high seas. That's, that's a talk for another day, what happens there. <laughs> um, so I will explain in more detail uh, what the United States specifically does to manage fisheries, but first I want to talk to you about the very special, unique ecosystem that we have here off our west coast, and that's called the California Current Large Marine Ecosystem. Has anyone ever seen this movie? What movie are these fish from? You can shout it out if you want. Finding Nemo. Finding Dory, but Finding Nemo series. Uh, <laughs> So uh, these are two kelp bass that are in the movie. Uh, this is a, a Disney film that is near and dear to my heart, and it's because this entire story took place off the California coast in the exact ecosystem that I'm about to tell you about. Um, that's just a bonus. This is a California sea lion in the movie. His name's Gerald. Um, so this map uh, is a figure of the California current large marine ecosystem. It's the blue shaded area. The blue hatching is the United States Exclusive Economic Zone, so that demarcates the 200 mile mark here. Um, and then the green hatching is Mexico. Within the marine ecosystem is the actual California current, the physical water current. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I think that those warm sunny days on the California beach are truly misleading and false advertising. So if you've ever been to California, you know that that beach water is cold. It is not like the Atlantic coast where it's like 80 degree bath water. 
our water off the Pacific coast is cold. And that's because the water current, the California current, it's a southward flowing continuation of the Aleutian current, which is from Alaska. That's why our water is so cold. I'm going to be coming back to finding Dory a lot tonight. So there's a scene in that movie where Dory and Marlin hitch a ride on the back of a sea turtle. They're actually surfing the California current in that movie. It's, it's famous because of that. So in Finding Nemo, they were hitching a ride on the sea turtle on the eastern Australian current. But in Finding Dory, they're on the California current. Um, so this diagram shows what makes our West Coast ecosystem tick. And it's a process, it's a function called upwelling. So what happens is that surface winds push surface water away from the coast, and cold, nutrient-rich water comes up from the deep and replaces that surface water. Those nutrients essentially fuel our marine food web. They essentially fertilize these little microscopic organisms called phytoplankton. They photosynthesize. And when those phytoplankton feed on the nutrients, that essentially provides a salad bar for, for smaller fish, with that, which then feed larger fish, which then feed larger marine mammals, sea turtles, and birds. Um, so this constant supply of nutrients is essentially the base of the food web and what makes us have such thriving fisheries off our west coast. So the nutrients bring the fisheries, the fisheries are what fuel the need for management. It's a natural resource that has a lot of different user groups. And I have backed that up by the seagulls in Finding Dory that constantly say mine to represent all the different user groups that might want some fish, including seabirds. Uh, so just to drive home that point, that nutrient-rich water that comes up from the deep and fuels our marine food web also is food for plants, and it's what um, it's what develops all the different types of special habitats that we have off of our west coast, including kelp forests and sea grass beds, which also, combined with California current water, really prefer cold water. So that's why we have kelp forests in the Atlantic coast as well. Okay, so first, before I get on to fisheries management, I just want to run you through our special ecosystems really quickly. The first one I already mentioned is kelp forests. Some of the animals that you might find in there is the famous Garibaldi. That's the marine state fish of California. That second one is a sheep fish. Uh, that's a kelp bass. Uh, those, those are the fish from my dory that I showed you. Um, that's an abalone. That's a very large marine snail. Uh, that's the world famous leopard shark. And of course, the Monterey Bay sea otter. Uh, next to seagrass beds. In seagrass beds, you might find uh, green sea turtles, also starfish. Uh, blue crabs, I love those guys. Um, green sea anemones and sea hares. That's uh, that's what I was holding in the picture at the beginning. Um, then there's also the pelagic habitat. Pelagic means open ocean, so something that's not in shallow water that you're stepping in on the beach. You know, off coast a little bit in deeper waters, and that's where you'll find your larger marine mammals and fish like whales, swordfish, of course the gray white shark, uh, dolphins, and mulla mulla, also commonly called sunfish. Uh, so now, I'll get into the crux of what I actually do. So, my charge as a fisheries management specialist is this. Conservation and management measures shall prevent overfishing while achieving on a continuing basis the optimum yield from each fishery for the U.S. fishing industry. That line comes from what we call the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. Um, it is a giant 300-page document that I'm not going to bore you with, which is why I just took out the most important line. Uh, this is the overarching line from this document, and essentially what it means is find the happy medium. Find the level of harvest where we are allowing our United States fishermen to maximize their economic opportunity while not, risking concert, well, while not posing a conservation risk to the fish stock. That's our charge. And the happy medium, like many other things in life, is very hard to find. Um, Fisheries management is a very collaborative process. Um, NOAA does not decide things unilaterally. We work in partnership with regional fisheries management councils. And each regional fishery management council produces these giant documents called fishery management plans. And what those do is they group alike fish uh, into one document and, to, and it, it describes all the detailed management measures that we have to take, um, to take care of them. So off our west coast, those fishery management plans include groundfish, highly migratory species, salmon, coastal pelagic species. 
We don't have a management plan for halibut or whiting, um, but that's because we manage them jointly via a treaty with Canada. So these are where all the United States Regional Management Councils are. Um, we work specifically with the Pacific Fishery Management Council, which is right here boxed in red. And this is kind of what it looks like. So the management councils are made up of all different kinds of stakeholders of people that care about fisheries. So the fishery service has a seat on the council. Then there's also state representatives from the fish and wildlife agencies of all four states. And there's also industry representatives, either ones that have known the fishing industry for decades or are heavily involved in marine conservation. Um, the Coast Guard has a seat on the council. Alaska has a non-voting seat on the council. And so all these people, it's, it's hundreds of people that come to these things. So five times a year, this council gets together and on a routine agenda discusses fishery measures. And it, they literally sit around a table in a ballroom and the chair says, all in favor of this measure say aye. They all raise their hands. All, all who say no, say no or abstain, etc. It's basically like a mini congress, um, but it's specifically pertaining to fisheries law. Um, so now I'll give you a quick rundown of, of the group, the specific groups of fish that we manage off our west coast. The first one is ground fish. That's our largest group of fish. We manage um, over 90 species of ground fish. Ground fish are exactly as they sound. They're, they are fish that live on or near the ocean floor. Um, and some of the common types are rockfish. Um, on a seafood menu in a restaurant, that might be marketed as snapper. Um, snapper is actually different types of rockfish. And there's also flatfish, roundfish, and some sharks and skates that live on the bottom. Uh, next is highly migratory species. That's also exactly as it sounds. It's fish that travel and migrate large distances in and out of US waters. So we actually do have a lot of international agreements with these fish as well. Um, that can include things like tuna, um, sharks, billfish and swordfish, and um, other types of fish like dorado. Dorado, um, if you've ever seen, uh, you know, like mahi-mahi fish tacos on the menu, that's actually dorado. Uh, next is salmon. Salmon probably takes most of our attention and funding off the West Coast, actually, because there are several uh, populations of salmon that are on the endangered species list. Um, also, they travel inland in rivers, so there's a lot of problem with, like, human development, dam building, agriculture, so there's a lot of habitat restoration and a lot of really high priority conservation measures taken for salmon. Um, we call them anadromous species. Um, what that means is that they spend portions of their life cycle in salt water and fresh water. So these are ocean salmon, but they travel inland into rivers, freshwater rivers and spawn. Uh, last is our coastal pelagic species fishery management plan. These are things, these are like small schooling fish, like a sardine or anchovy. Also includes mackerel and market squid and krill. Um, this fishery is very important because these, these little small fish um, provide a strong forage base for larger animals like whales. So that's reinforced by these pictures. When you see those awesome um, National Geographic videos of like whales lunging, taking a huge mouthful of fish, these are the fish that they're, that they're targeting, mostly anchovy and sardine. Um, so, um, my last portion, I want to leave you guys plenty of time for questions, and I know I'm zooming through it quickly. Um, I want to talk to you guys about some very controversial conservation topics um, off our West Coast. All of these have made national television, so I'm sure you've heard different versions of these stories in one way or the other. Um, the first thing I want to talk to you about is leatherback sea turtle conservation. So, every summer, off the coast of primarily Central California, we get blooms of jellyfish. Um, leatherback sea turtles love these jellyfish. Um, they actually, they love them so much that they travel all the way from their nesting beach in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia. They go across the entire Pacific Ocean and they come to the Central California coast to feed on jellyfish, specifically these brown sea nettles. Unfortunately, during the summertime, that is the exact same time that we have our swordfish fishery. Um, primarily with our boats that fish with drift gill nets. Drift gill nets are also pretty much exactly as they sound. They are nets that drift in the water and they catch fish by gilling them. So basically a fish of a particular size will swim into one of these squares, they'll freak out and then they'll back up and then their gills will get caught in the net. Um, 
they, we have these net extenders down here so we can let larger mammals like whales and things swim over top, but certain animals spend time at specific depths. So wild drift gill nets are awesome at catching a lot of fish. They catch all different kinds of fish that are the same size. And so these have been very problematic in the past because they have a high bycatch rate. Bycatch is essentially when a fisherman catches non-target species, stuff other than what they were going after. And that's very wasteful. So our drift gill net fishery used to be a huge problem in the past, um, but the fishery has shrunk considerably because of leatherback sea turtles. Um, basically, because leatherback sea turtles are critically endangered, the, specifically, the specific Pacific Coast population I'm talking about, um, NOAA Fisheries implemented a seasonal closure. So in this hatched area, from August 15 to November 15, which is prime time for the jellyfish bloom, uh, drift gill net boats are not allowed to fish in this area. Consequently, in very certain years called El Nino years, those are essentially years that have very um, unusually warm water for our west coast. Uh, what will happen is we get these huge blooms of tuna crabs that come up in the, south, in the Southern California Bight area here, and that actually attracts a lot of loggerhead sea turtles that typically feed more southern, but they will follow the tuna crabs north into our waters, and that also overlaps with our drift gill net fishery. So we also have a closure right here in the Southern California Bight um, during El Nino years only. Um, the controversy comes in because there are still a lot of people that want drift gill nets eliminated completely. Um, and the trouble with that is even though our swordfish fishing that happens by U.S. fishermen uh, has substantially decreased, United States demand for swordfish has not. And so what that causes is that we now import an alarming amount of swordfish from other countries overseas. So we're ordering our fish overseas and we're ordering it from countries that do not have as good of a fishery management system as we do. So we're basically just outsourcing the negative effects. Um, so this is talked about a lot in the news. Um, if you have any questions about it, you can let me know. Um, next is our California sea lions. So back in the early 70s, we passed a piece of legislation called the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And that act essentially says, you cannot harm or kill a marine mammal, endangered or not, for any reason whatsoever. Um, around that time, there was about 75,000 California sea lions off the west coast. Today, there are over 300,000. So, really good for the Marine Mammal Protection Act. It had a really positive outcome for sea lions. But the problem is that 300,000 is actually overcarrying capacity for the species, and we now have too many sea lions. Um, fishermen actually, like, they're a pest. Fishermen hate sea lions. We have problems with sea lions. Uh, sea lions are really smart, actually. They actually follow fishing boats, because they figured out, like, ooh, they go bring me a ton of fish, and they'll chew on the nets, and they'll ruin them, and they'll pick fish off of hooks, and fishermen hate them. Um, the other problem is that uh, because there's so many sea lions, they're eating uh, endangered salmon. So, real quick, little shout out to Finding Dory, California sea lions from the movie. Um, so, we have a lot of, um, salmon are a big problem for us, a big conservation problem, especially Chinook salmon. So even though sea lions can eat lots of different things, uh, they're little stinkers, and they've decided that they just love the endangered populations of Chinook salmon that uh, come out of, say, for example, the Willamette River up in Oregon, um, so much that sea lions are actually decimating the endangered populations of salmon, way more so than humans are at this point. Um, so a ridiculous amount of money was spent on trying to solve this. Uh, noise deterrence to scare them, um, relocation, this is ridiculous. This sea lion, was taken from the Willamette Falls, flown all the way down to San Diego, California, and within 48 hours, they branded him. They branded him so they know which one he is. Within 48 hours, he had swam all the way back up the coast to Willamette Falls and continued eating the endangered Chinook salmon. Um, so nothing worked. So now the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife actually has a federal permit to shoot sea lions. Um, only the repeat offenders. Um, so this is a huge controversy. Normally when I tell U of A students this, they like run up to me after class and they're like, did you try this? Did you try this? And I'm like, trust me, so many tax dollars went to this. Um, 
Another thing that's, that's really rough is that we have an endangered population of killer whales off the Pacific Northwest coast. They specifically only feed on Chinook salmon. They don't have all the other options out there that sea lions do. So that's another drive for shooting them is that we have an incredibly endangered population of killer whales that has a lack of prey, partly due to this overpopulation of sea lions. So it's a, it's a crazy mess. Um, Shippard, I have about 10 minutes left. Is that okay? Okay. I have so many slides, I needed to like regulate myself and make sure I wasn't going for too long. Um, so our next topic is whale entanglement. Um, so I have this little stack here. In 2016 specifically, a record 71 whale entanglement sightings were recorded off of our west coast. This is the highest number we ever had. And so, what happened? Um, the Whale Entanglement Response Team is a, is a rescue team of folks that work just down the hall from me in my office. Every single time you ask them one of this, they're like, what the heck happened? Why did over 70 whales got entangled in fishing gear this year? They all call it, they're like, oh, it was the perfect storm. And so here's what happened. We have more and more whale watching folks out on the water every year. So more people on the water, more sightings, automatically. We see things that we otherwise might not have seen other years. Second of all, the Dungeness Crab Fishery, it's a state fishery off California, opened five months late. And that's because during that year, we had unusually warm water off our west coast. Warm water causes algae blooms. Algae blooms produce domoic acid, which gets ingested into the tissue of crabs. And that makes it so that the fishery for crabs doesn't open because it's not safe for us, humans, the ones ordering the crab, to consume it. Because it has too, too high of domoic acid levels. So, because of that, Dungeness Crab Fishery opened five months late. Happened to open during the exact seasonal migration of humpback whales down the coast. And at the same time, normally whales actually migrate further off the shore, but during that same year, all the weird ocean temperature things happened, anchovy, which is the whale's primary prey, swam inshore. They were very condensed inshore, right where the state fishery is. So you have the crab pot fishery that just opened, so there's fishermen that are five months behind in income, so understandably so, you got a bunch of them rushing out to start fishing their crab once domoic acid levels were down. And so basically we had a ton of whale entanglement with crab pot gears, because whales migrated inshore to follow their prey as they were traveling down the coast to their breeding grounds in Mexico. Um, so this was a mess. We had calls every day uh, to almost to go check on a whale. Um, we only confirmed 71, but we did get calls about more. Sometimes by the time our response team gets out there, the whale is gone, and there's nothing that we can do to help. But I know that a lot of money goes to it, we try our best. Um, so this last topic uh, is near and dear to my heart. I actually spe specialize in ground fish fisheries. Um, this is a positive one. This one's not doom and gloom, um, but it has a gloomy past. So in the 1990s, Several stocks of ground fish got overfished. Um, what happened is that the fleet grew exponentially. More and more boats entered the fleet, and we didn't have a limited entry permit system in place back then yet. So more and more boats entered the fleet faster than we could manage them, or come up with a way, uh, an effective way of managing them. And we managed them by something called trip limits. So say that a boat is going out, and they're like, I want to catch whiting. We had a catch limit for whiting, but we didn't have a catch limit for all the other species that they might catch. And so we just put trip limits in place. Like, okay, on every trip, you can't catch more than three metric tons of sardine as your bycatch. But there was never a cap on that. So every day, fishermen go out and, and they'll fish up to the bycatch in those trip limits. Um, but over time, that just totally decimates fish populations. And so, in 2000, the Secretary of Commerce declared the entire U.S. ground fish fishery a federal disaster, um, and we declared 10 stocks overfished. And then because we had to turn around and put really heavy management measures in place, there was a lot of economic hardship that followed. Lots of doors closed. Lots of fishermen turned in their nets. Lots of doors and processors closed, and all the different businesses that are associated with industrial fishing. Um, so what we did to turn this around uh, we did a complete management overhaul, um, implemented a completely new management scheme, and then today, nine out of 10 of those stocks are rebuilt and healthy. 
and we are opening, reopening lots of fisheries, and the future for the ground fish fishery is better than ever now. Um, we're only waiting on one stock um, that's still overfished, and that's this fish. This is the, called the yellow eye rock fish, appropriately named because it's yellow eye. Um, the target rebuilding year for yellow eye rockfish is uh, 2029. We are expecting with next year's stock assessment that we will be able to declare it rebuilt almost a decade ahead of schedule. So, um, with that, I want to show you a video that we made about this effort. We're going to attempt a quick fix. Bear with us. In the early 2000s, the state of fisheries on the west coast of the United States were in really bad shape. The west coast ground fish fishery was actually declared a, a federal disaster due to the decline of several important species. And the fishermen on the west coast were really impaired in their ability to make a living. It was a huge deal to a lot of people, so the need was obvious that something had to be done. I fished out of Newport, Oregon all my life. And at that time, you just went fishing. I didn't really understand a whole lot about the management behind things. I didn't understand how they set quotas. In the U.S., our local seafood is some of the best managed in the world because our fishermen must abide by limits on how much of a targeted species they can catch. Regional management councils set these quotas using information from the previous seasons both in the fisheries themselves and dedicated scientific surveys, along with environmental data that may affect reproduction and survival rates. One of the big problems on the West Coast back in the late 1990s was that this information was fragmented 
and incomplete. The issue there was these surveys weren't always conducted annually. They were often conducted only along a portion of the coast at a time by larger Alaska-class boats that typically didn't spend much of their time fishing along the west coast. And we weren't able to track the abundance of these species as closely as we would have liked. So in the late 1990s, NOAA Fisheries partnered with the local commercial fishing fleet aboard the smaller trawlers. By working with local boats, captains and crew that know the fishing ground as well. You're going to maximize the amount of habitat that we're able to sample. This cooperative research partnership expands from the Canadian border down to Mexico and has continually improved the quantity and quality of data collected. Trawl maps are outfitted with multiple sensors to measure real-time catch information together with oceanographic conditions. And on board, a wireless network connects measuring boards, scales, code readers, printers, and touchscreen computers to maximize efficiency, and in turn, the number of sites that can be sampled. Annually, we see approximately 635 different species. We also collect about 120,000 fish lengths, and these are very valuable for the stock testing. So, six or 800 toes a year on the West Coast, done by industry and the science community. It's, it's awesome and it has just steadily gotten better. While trawl fishing is well suited for flatter, soft bottoms, there's a lot of rocky, high-relief habitat along the west coast, which attracts different communities and species. This is especially true along the coast of Southern California. We were being regulated on a couple of overfished groundfish, Boccaccio and Calcot. When this all began, one of the biggest problems was the trawl nets couldn't sample the habitat that these fish lived in. And after speaking with local sport and commercial fishermen, the idea was to use hook and line gear to sample these habitats. The hook and line survey, which began in 2003, involves three participating vessels that give you up 200 predetermined sample stations. Combining these two survey methods, stock assessors have a much more comprehensive data set for the whole West Coast. The stock assessment has become more robust over time, and that's due to an improved understanding of the biology of the stock and more data. Now that we have a survey that has persisted for 20 years on this coast, we're able to look back, and what we've learned is that our perception of the past is constantly changing as you get more information. The management of West Coast groundfish is in a much better place now than it was 20 years ago. We have a better handle on overfishing. We're able to put in place the right management for the right species at the right time. Since the early 2000s, when 10 species were designated as overfished, all but one has been rebuilt. And that final species, yellow eye rockfish, is trending positively. It's absolutely worthwhile for us to do this because the research that we're doing, the information we're getting is critical to our continued existence. It's important to have a fishery that is going to continue. In fact, as one of the guys had asked me the other day on the boat, do you think there's a future in the fishery? And I said, I think the future's better now than it ever has been. I really do, and I believe that. It's a very encouraging final note to end on. It's, uh, yes, we can. We, we, uh, we can. Um, and, and so now we're going to turn to the, the questions. Oh, sorry. Not sorry. over yet. Hold on. Sorry, Shepard. I just had a couple of take home messages that I wanted to leave you with. Sorry, I should have given Shepard a head up, heads up about that. Um, so, with that video, I just want to leave you with a couple of take home messages. These are the things that I would want anybody that knows anything about fisheries to know. Um, the California current large marine ecosystem off our west coast is immensely productive, and it's immensely special for that reason. It's why we have so many thriving fisheries. NOAA Fisheries conducts stock assessments to get an idea of how many fish that there are, and then it's our job to set sustainable harvest limits so that we don't overfish those stocks. And because of the strict federal laws that we have in place and our ability to enforce those waters, the United States has some of the best managed fisheries in the world. With that, 
and we'll go back to Shepard. Oh. That was it. All right. Sorry. <laughs> cool. Um, well, that was absolutely fascinating, and what a great presentation. Thank you so much. And And, uh, and as I was mentioning, now we're going to start taking questions. For those of you who may not have been to the Science Cafe before, if you can raise your hand, then I will bring you the microphone so that everybody hears the question being asked. Um, and if you're not comfortable asking your question in the microphone, you can raise your hand and tell me the question, and I'll ask the question for you. Um, and with that, I did see a hand go up right here, right away, and I saw another hand go up back there, and I see a hand here, so I'll get you to you in the order that I see the hands go up. Here's our first question. Uh, on your council, you, you didn't say anything about native representation. And I just wondered uh, how the native uh, population of people affect your fisheries. So that's a really good question. I don't actually think I said that out loud, but um, a member that represents United States tribal fishermen does have a voting seat on the council. Um, there's not too many tribes that request um, quotas of fish from federal waters, uh, but specifically the Quinault Indian Nation up in Washington requests an allocation of sardine every year. Um, they also um, request anchovy every once in a while, and it is actually a member of the Quinault that sits on the council currently. Thank you, great question. And then we have a question back over here. Those people on the other side of the L in the room will be able to hear this, but they can't hear the, or see the person asking. How is the health of the kelp forest on California? How is the what, sorry? Health. Oh, the health. Um, better than it was a few years ago. Um, during El Nino years that I mentioned earlier, that's when like very warm water temperatures come to the West Coast. We have those and we can sort of predict those and we kind of know when they're coming. But in 2013, actually, we had this thing you may have heard about in the news called the blob. This was an out of nowhere, huge warm current of water that came and it actually really decimated our kelp forest populations because kelp forests need pretty cold water. Um, and so we expect kelp to deteriorate some in El Nino years, but something called the blob came by that was way worse than your average El Nino year. and. Uh, it was worst in the Southern California Bight, LA, the San Diego area, um, and we almost lost, we actually lost 95% of our kelp forests off the Southern California coast. Um, but they are they are rebuilding. They're not as great as they once were, but they're getting better and better every year. Wow, that's, that's devastating loss. I'm glad they're getting better. Um, I think I saw your hand go up here, and then I'm coming up to you, and then you'll be next. We've heard that fisheries are all around the world have really declined dramatically in, in many places. And I guess the question is, um, have you gotten requests from other countries, with all the experience that NOAA has with monitoring and designing um, sustainable fishing practices, do you get inquiries from other countries to, um, for consultation about how they could apply that? We do. Um, I'll, I'll say that a lot of the, the issues with many other countries that have fisheries, um, it tends to be fisheries that don't have as much money as a first world country like the United States and they can't afford enforcement. So while they might have great science and they might actually have their own management measures and good law in place, if they don't have the funds to patrol the waters and enforce that law, it's basically just like a paper law, a, a paper rule. Um, but for that front end, um, developing the policy, developing the management, we do. We do consult a lot of other countries, especially Mexico and Canada. Good to know. So coming around to the next hand, let's go up. Here we go. I understand that California has resisted deep sea drilling for oil, mm -hmm. and that now there's a big possibility it will be open to deep sea drilling. Mm -hmm. If that does happen, do you have an idea of what effect upon the fisheries that will have? That's very hard to say. Um, a lot of that will depend on the area that's actually designated for the drilling, how far spread it is, what locations. Um, so it's hard to answer that question specifically. But deep sea drilling is never going to bring anything good for fisheries. So there, 
will be a lot of analysis that goes into it to try and sort of project the effects and see how much we can mitigate ahead of time. I'm sorry, I can't answer that more specifically. It depends on so much that gets decided. But you are correct. California is pushing against it. Thank you. And then we've got another question over here. So for quite a number of years, Mexico has had a very difficult time regulating their fisheries. How much does that kind of overlap into U.S. fishing areas, and how much of a problem does that cause? That is a very good question. Um, and my pause is because I'm trying to mine my brain files to come up with a thoughtful answer. Just a bunch of complaining. Um, so Mexico is one of those countries that has good fishery scientists and does have reasonable laws in place, but their, their enforcement is the problem. Um, most fishermen in Mexico often don't follow the law. Um, there are a handful of stocks off the Pacific coast that we share with Mexico, uh, tuna being one of those, sardine being another. Um, I will tell you that there is a lot of effort that goes into improving our international relationship with Mexico. It's getting better and better, but we do have problems in sharing stocks with them, and namely the two that I mentioned, Tuna and Sardine. Um, I'm trying to say something more hopeful. <laughs> um, Mexico is getting better at their catch reporting. I will say that. They, um, their, their fisheries agency, which is called Conapesca, um, is getting better about uh, publishing their catch information and reporting that to us so that we can get a handle on how much they fish. Um, but it's an ongoing effort to better our relationship with them and get a better handle on how to share specific uh, Does that answer your question? I'm going to jump in and say, are we aware, are, are there are there fisheries that have collapsed, for example, uh, in Mexican waters because they've just been overfished and it's gone? Or? Not that I know of, actually. More of that occurs in the Sea of Cortez, Gulf of Mexico. That's where, like, the core of um, fisheries collapse issues have happened in Mexico. There of a stock that's collapsed historically off Mexico because of strictly Mexico fishing, but no, I haven't been around as long as some people. I could check on that and get back to you just to make sure I didn't give you a wrong answer. We've got another question back here. Thank you. Hi. Um, thanks for being here. I actually live in the state of Oregon. I'm visiting. And Welcome. Thank you. We have had a tremendous increase in the amount of timbering that's happening in our state in the uh -huh. last three years. Yeah. In fact, you would be hard-pressed to find any watershed that is not being heavily logged at this time. Mm -hmm. And since there is a very direct connection between forest ecology and salmon health, mm -hmm. I wonder if there is any coordination between agencies um, for protection and efforts to increase and protect salmon stock mm -hmm. because we're seeing timber requests on an unprecedented scale. It's pretty staggering. So the answer to your question is yes. And that agency that we would uh, primarily work with is the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I don't know specifically, like specific projects, like NOAA Fisheries called the, wild, the Fish and Wildlife Service on this day and made this plan. But there is a lot of coordination when it comes to um, opening up river passage and removing dams. Um, there's also a lot of coordination when it comes to salmon hatcheries which we are breeding in Oregon and Washington to supplement the salmon population. Uh, so there is interagency work there. Okay, thank you. Hopefully, things will get better there. Sorry, that, to, sorry to hear about that. You're right up front. 50 years ago in California, my favorite food was abalone. Obviously, these protections you speak of were not in place back then. So is there any hope for uh, abalone returning? So what kind of abalone did you target? White? 
Black? Yes, both, actually. Both? Okay. So, um, black abalone is a hard one because their die-off was due to a disease, which was because of prevailing ocean temperatures. Um, white abalone was our fault. Uh, they got overfished. Um, white abalone used to be in the hundreds of thousands. There's now less than 2,000. And uh, the problem there is that abalone need to be near each other under the water because they, you know, shoot off eggs and things into the water that need to be fertilized by males, so their, their vicinity to each other is important. And so the more and more the population goes down, it's like it exacerbates the problem further and further because they're further and further away from each other. Um, NOAA Fisheries has this list of animals called uh, Species in the Spotlight. They are 10 species that we think are most endangered in becoming extinct, uh, most vulnerable to becoming extinct. All listed on the Endangered Species Act. White abalone is one of those species in the spotlight, and part of it is to promote um, what a priority they, ha they have to be. So I will tell you for white abalone specifically, and actually the white abalone specialists work right down the hall from me. Um, we work with a government laboratory in uh, La Jolla called the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. We have in-house breeding programs for white abalone to reintroduce to the wild. Um, numbers are currently increasing. We just had our first successful reintroduction just a few weeks ago, actually. So we're hoping that uh, we're hoping that that last ditch effort helps. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Got another question right here. Mine really isn't with a question. This is an incredibly informing to all of us, especially those of us that know about this much of it. So thank you for making it so. So simple to understand. Oh, of course. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you guys for being interested. And I see another question, and I'll get back to this side soon. I've been up fishing in Alaska, specifically Ketchikan, several times. And uh, we've gone out with a, a guide, and uh, he usually has six feet on his boat. It happens that we were all, um, you know, all from one group. Uh, he claims the size of the salmon catch has decreased as the number of whales have increased that he notices in the area. He says that the salmon and the whales are competing for the anchovies and sardines and you know, what they feed on. I, I was having a little hard time believing that, but can you say anything to that? Um, that's 100% correct. Um, it, it depends on the species of whale that you're talking about. Um, humpbacks. Okay, so humpbacks, um, their main prey, they can eat krill, uh, but they prefer small forage fish like anchovy. Um, Chinook salmon and coho salmon also eat anchovy and sardine. So yes, that is two, two predator animals that go after the same thing. Where were you at? Okay, so um, anchovy, the anchovy population actually is at record high right now. Um, our most recent survey scanned, um, you know, and, and our surveys, even though we, you know, our stock assessment scientists do a lot of math to get the most correct number that they can, there's no way you can count all the fish in the sea. So our stock assessment numbers are treated as minimums. But we scanned 800,000 metric tons of anchovy this last summer, which is a record high. So there's lots of forage out there for humpback whales. They're they're happy right now. And, and the salmon, is that? Yeah, yeah, the salmon's happy too. Which we really need the salmon to be happy because they're endangered, and I need more of them to feed the whales. So everybody stops suing me. <laughs> it's a it's a complicated role. Yep. Here's another question. Mm -hmm. uh, I was reading a book a while back where a person was a whale paleontologist. And he talked about uh, beached whales off the Atacama Desert that if, uh, in their dig was about 10,000 years of covering. Is there any information, recent information, on beaching of whales off, the Cal uh, off California? Yeah, sure. So we, um, our uh, whale entanglement response team um, always responds to calls for beached whales. 
Uh, that can happen for a variety of reasons. These days, sadly, it's because the whale has ingested a lot of plastic. Um, but it can be for other reasons. They could be emaciated just because they're sick. Um, that could be for a number of reasons. Or they could beach themselves because they got entangled in fishing gear and uh, naturally went towards the coast. Um, but we do keep a careful watch on that. Every single whale that beaches, we get a call and we go out and do what we can. Are there, are there more whales that have been beaching themselves? I seem to have noticed that as a, something in the news. Is that a new phenomenon? It's not new. Um, we expect more whales to beach themselves during certain seasons and times, um, but it's not, there's not like an unusual record, per se, of beached whales. There have been higher numbers of entanglement reportings in recent years for the, you know, for, that happens for many different reasons, but beached whales, not so much. Um, the only spike that I would note is an increasing number of whales that beach themselves and then subsequently die because of the amount of trash in their stomachs. It's sad. Here, we have another question in the back here. Hi. Um, I have two questions. One is, what can we do as like little people to help this out? Because I teach little people, so it would be nice to go back to my classroom and tell them something to help. Yes, there is, um, that's a hard question to answer, and it's, well, actually, no. That's an easy question to answer. It's a hard thing. It's a hard question to convince people of. Um, you can do all the things that everybody always hears in the news. You can reduce your use of plastic. Uh, plastic is this ubiquitous item that has penetrated every commercial industry in the world because it's cheap and durable. Um, but that presents a really big problem for our marine ecosystem. So the more and more that you can uh, push those messages of reusable grocery bags and reusable cups, reusable water bottles, um, slowly over time we can not get away from our wasteful trash practices. That, that is a very powerful thing that you can do on an individual scale. Um, my friends and family made fun of me at first, but I definitely pushed the straw campaign uh, when, it, when it first started. And, I can't tell you how many countless people see my Facebook posts about it or just saw me using a reusable straw. And they're like, oh, Lynn, I got a reusable straw. Or, you know, oh, I got a, a reusable tumbler for, from Starbucks to use. Uh, it can have a huge impact. I mean, the other things that you can do, which are um, hugely helpful to any uh, environmental issue, is to, to do your best to, to be energy efficient. Try to, we need to shift our, our dependence off of fossil fuels and onto more renewable sources of energy, and that will help so many things all around. All right, let me follow up. Sorry. Sure, go ahead. Um, do you see, so you were talking about how they're opening up to hunt, to uh, shooting repeat offenders with the seals. Do you ever see it becoming like the deer hunting where they put tags on seals? And yes. Like, yeah, you see it becoming like a lottery system where people could go out and hunt seals as just like regular Oh like, no. no! So like no no no. We don't um, we don't tag them in a sense of like providing an incentive to shoot them. No, it is illegal for a fisherman to shoot a sea lion. They will get prosecuted and they will get prison time for that, or they'll just get a gigantic fine. Whatever the office of law enforcement decides. The people that actually shoot the sea lions are actually biologists that work at Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and they have a specific federal permit from NOAA that gives them permission to do that. Um, it's illegal for anybody else to touch them. Your question. Here's another one in the back. On that note, is there an effort to remove those barriers and maybe make a more manageable solution to the Somalian population problem? No. I wish I had a better answer to that. Um, the most thing that I can say is that everything we could possibly think of was tried on the front end. Um, at some point in time, you have to think about what you're using tax dollars for continually. So we tried everything we could up front. Um, and so that is the current solution, is only repeat offenders. They actually brand them so they can like tell them apart from the other ones. That's the current solution. I'm sure we'll come up with something in the future. I'm sure we've got you know, people brainstorming this right now. But as of right now, that's, that's the the immediate last-ditch effort that we have to do so that they don't continue to decimate the Chinook salmon populations beyond our repair. 
to interject myself again, are, are there must be natural predators for sea lions? Um, are those uh, are the populations of those natural predators uh, somehow lower and therefore not balancing the sea lion population? To an extent, yes. Um, so the main predator for a sea lion is going to be a whale. Um, the thing with whales is that most of them are don't just eat one thing. Killer whales are really annoying in that sense because they just eat Chinook salmon. Uh, but other whales um, could eat sea lions. But in general, they have multiple sources of prey, so they're just kind of opportunistic in that they eat what's around. Um, but naturally, the problem is that the sea lion population is so big. It's just so huge. So even though there are plenty of whales around that might eat them, it's not enough whales to keep it in check. It's, it's an ecology issue. It's totally off balance. And when the sea lion population declined so far that there was legislation enacted to protect them, was that because humans were hunting sea lions? Mm -hmm. So there were, um, and it wasn't just about sea lions. The Marine Mammal Protection Act was also because of the uh, because of whales as well being attacked and hunted. Um, so really, that was a blanket legislation to protect all marine mammals. But yes, they used to be targeted. There was huge bycatch. Um, in nets. So now, it's actually, if you ever want to YouTube it, there are plenty of videos online of fishermen that are like bringing up a net, a, a load, and, the, and there's a lot of cursing that happens when they see that there's a sea lion in there because they have to drop the net and lose all the fish so they can put the sea lion out because the marine mammal protect it's like strict fines if you don't follow that thing to a T. Fascinating. Uh, are there other questions? Thank you. Over. I don't I'm not seeing any other hands, so I, I might have to keep asking a few, okay. a few more questions. That's all right. Um, you talked a lot about salmon. Are there any salmon success stories? Are there populations of particular, particular species of salmon that have rebounded thanks to uh, efforts of, I don't know, interventions of some kind? Um, so I can say that there are populations of salmon that are increasing as a result of our efforts, none of which we've been able to bring off the endangered species list. So the ones that are having troubles are still on there, still having troubles, but we are, it's, it's a long road ahead. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure everyone's aware California is um, one of the largest agricultural states uh, in our nation, and there's a lot of development in California, and over time we didn't realize know how badly we were polluting rivers and decimating river passage and we didn't know back in the day when the army corps was putting in all the dams for hydropower like we did you know it was kind of an oopsie from humans we didn't realize how badly it was going to affect everything and now it's a it's a slower process to backpedal on that than it is to move forward on it so it's a long road ahead but um my coworkers and I make fun of the entire region and all of our bosses because they're all salmon specialists. And we always think that the rest of us are the red-headed stepchild that doesn't get any attention. Um, so I can assure you that billions of dollars goes into trying to think about ways to help salmon. It's an important fish for humans and, and animals. So. Thank you. And can you tell us you are a co-leader of a sea turtle restoration and ecology project, is that right? Can you tell us about that project? Sure. Um, so my technical uh, charge at work every day is to manage fisheries, but my passion is sea turtle conservation, so much that they let me work on sea turtles every once in a while, because it turns out that I'm more helpful than some of the actual sea turtle biologists. Um, I, um, we have a uh, very large population of green sea turtles off the coast of uh, California. And we have yet to designate critical habitat for them. So every single time that you list an animal on the Endangered Species Act, an obligation that comes with that is also to designate critical habitat to protect as well as the species itself. Um, so uh, I am helping scientists in La Jolla uh, sort of map out areas along the coast of where we see green sea turtles the most, because in order for them to designate a protected area, they have to know where they are. Um, so right now, I'm working on a, I'm working on a project in a, a lagoon in Carlsbad. That's a, a city in Southern California, kind of between Long Beach and San Diego. 
Um, I noticed one year that I, we kept on getting phone calls about uh, dead sea turtles washing up in that lagoon. Um, and the pictures were gnarly. It was poor sea turtles' carapace, which just ruined. So it was clearly a boat strike. Um, and so I was a little curious about it, so I um, went and got a kayak with a couple friends one day, and we went into the lagoon. We found a huge patch of seagrass right in the back of the lagoon. Um, the lagoon is like kind of long and skinny, stretches inland a lot. Um, but in order to get back into those seagrass beds, you have to go through in, uh, a speedboating arena. Um, and so that answered my question right there. I was like, ah, turtles are traversing through this lagoon, trying to get to the seagrass beds in the back, boats are striking them. Um, so it's my little mini project that I'm trying to establish a citizen science volunteer program through local aquariums there. So where like everyday uh, people of interest can grab a kayak or a paddleboard and come out and they can snap a photo of a turtle, which their photo um, has embedded lat launch coordinates and I'm working on a map to uh, show the sightings of the sea turtles. Um, so that's just one location that I'm working on now, but I'm gonna give that to our government scientists Hopefully that something will come out of that. We can at least get maybe some signs out there in the future that lowers boating speeds and says like, hey, look out, there's sea turtles here. Um, but hopefully we'll do that all along all along the Southern California coast. That's just my starting point right now. Thank you. Um, there's for one in the back over here. All right. And thanks for yeah, Hold on. Huh. Coming to you. So everybody can hear. I can hear you. He just wants everybody else to hear you. So they can answer the question. <laughs> we're from Seattle. Uh, we're snowbirds down here. Uh, but how far north do the uh, turtles go along the coast? So that's a really interesting question. The furthest north, uh, the very furthest north population of green sea turtles is right outside my apartment complex in Long Beach, California. Um, there is a population of about 80 to 100 green sea turtles that takes up residence in the San Gabriel River. That's highly unusual. Um, the reason why they swim up river is because there's a couple power plants that use once through cooling. So they take in cold water from the river and they use it as a coolant for their equipment and then the water that they outsource is warm. Um, green sea turtles are typically subtropical animals, so they like warmer waters, but they've managed to wiggle their way up the coast, found these power plants and they kind of surf in it, like surf in the outflow. Um, and uh, that is as far north as they get. But also, over time, um, there's also a huge population in San Diego Bay that over time has developed, and that also has to do with the seagrass bed that we have. They love to munch on seagrass. Um, so those, those two things, available, random availability of warm water from power plants in Long Beach and San Diego, actually in San Diego Bay, uh, is where the concentrations of green sea turtles are, and very, very hugging the coast uh, where seagrass beds are. Good question. Fascinating. Thanks. Got another one right here. So there's been a great increase in commercial fish farming. Has uh, that contributed to taking the pressure off of, of some of the wild fisheries? So yes, that is um, that is a plus to fish farming because it definitely does take pressure off the wild stock. Um, but fish farming is actually super controversial uh, simply because it produces a lot of waste from the fish. It's very concentrated waste, which then pollutes the water. So while it is um, while it's something that honestly we have to do because human population is growing and there's no sign of it stopping growing and fish farming is pretty much the only way that we're going to be able to meet the seafood demand, global seafood de de demand, that is a con of fish farming is the pollution, the concentrated waste that it, that it produces. Many complex problems. Yes, yeah, so many problems. That's my job every day, just dealing with these problems. Got another one over here. On the East Coast, there's some people that are doing multi-trophic level fish farming with algae, mussels, scallops. Um, they don't have cute sea cucumbers there. Is there anything similar that's happening on the West Coast? Not yet, but in the works. Um, there's actually a, um, a mollusk farm right in Carlsbad, actually, that is trying to work on that sort of a project. 
We actually don't even have permits for that sort of thing off the U.S. West Coast yet, but it's in the works. People are, are thinking about it, um, and I am hoping that something like that comes in the future. Just, just to help me understand, because I've never heard of that, and maybe the rest of us, um, that 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 approach to farming. What are the advantages of of that? It, it sounds like there's. There's, there's creatures living at different levels in the water column, or how does it work? So it's essentially like, rather than your typical fish farm where you just have a ton of fish in a pen and you're tossing pellets at them to eat, um, and then they're producing a bunch of waste, it's a way to reduce the amount of waste that comes from a fish farm by basically creating a food web in itself. So you're farming multiple species at one time. One species that eats one is prey, the other that eats the other, um, and it reduces the waste, but you're still farming multiple species. Cool. Here's another question up here. This, this is kind of a question out of the blue. Uh, what's been the effect of Fukushima on the uh, radioactivity uh, exposure to fish? Uh, that's a great question. Um, that's ongoing research. We don't have a... The short answer is that there are effects. We have detected radioactivity in fish. Um, the cumulative conclusion, like it has impacted them this much, is, is not decided yet. It's ongoing. And another question that I had <clears throat> was, uh, had to do with uh, policing the, uh, uh, the catch uh, with respect to the number of uh, vessels going out fishing. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is the sequence of events that takes place uh, before the, uh, the fishing vessels know what their limits are? Um, you mean, um, oh, do you mean like, like how we publish catch limits every year, that sort of a thing? Um, so, so yes, so um, basically what happens is at one of those specific fishery management council meetings, um, basically they'll vote on catch limits that will become in place the following year. So they do it in advance, and then they give that information to me at NOAA Fisheries. They say, hey, hey NOAA Fisheries, this is what we decided. By the way, you had a vote, because you sit on the council as well. Um, and then I take that information, and then I actually prepare all the paperwork that publishes it in into law. So there's a whole classic government giant paperwork process that goes into it. Um, we prepare all that paperwork and what we do is we publish it in what we call the Federal Register. It's basically like a newspaper for the government that um, it puts on public display all the things that we plan to finalize. And so we, uh, we put those catch limits out in what we call a proposed rule. Uh, we usually put that out for public comment anywhere from 30 to 45 days. We collect public input on it and we finalize it. Once we finalize it, it gets published into regulation and that's, um, then fishermen know, okay, so for the year 2020, so for instance, for instance, I actually just submitted a final rule that will publish Pacific mackerel harvest limits for um, the uh, 2020 and 2021 fishing years. We published them two years in advance. We try to do that as much as we can because fishermen need time to uh, be like, okay, this is how much the fleet can catch next year. And they, you know, they have a lot of workings for business behind the scenes where they do like, how much money am I gonna spend on new nets? Uh, who am I gonna contract to sell fish to, et cetera. So we do that to give them as much heads up as possible about what kind of opportunity they're gonna have. That would be based upon the number of vessels that would be uh, in that area. Correct. For most could you, fisheries, could you repeat the question oh, yeah. so everybody so, he, he asked if those catch limits are, are partially based on uh, the number of vessels in the fleet. Um, and in most cases, the answer to that is yes. Particularly for our larger fisheries where there's a huge market for the fish um, and there's a lot of boats, a lot of demand, we actually have what we call a limited entry permit system whereby we cap the total amount of permits um, that boats can hold to enter the fishery or we cap of vessels that a fleet can hold. Um, so um, by, it depends on the fishery. There's all kinds of things that go into it. But by capping the capacity of the vessels, it means we can never pull in more than this amount of fish that fits on this many vessels of this size sort of a thing. 
All right, we got another one over here. I think it's pretty amazing that we've had all these conversations and the big topic of our lives, global warming, has not been mentioned. Do you feel like this is just a, a huge problem looming in the future that's going to change all the things you need to work on? It absolutely will. Um, I'm glad you brought it up. We have an entire team of scientists that are part of an ecosystem management group. Um, and what they do right now is very abstract because for some reason global climate change is just always the last priority for federal funding. Um, but we have an entire team of fisheries biologists dedicated to try and predict impact of fisheries. So some effects that we are already seeing from climate change. One thing that climate change is doing to the ocean is it's warming. Um, warmer temperatures will cause fish populations to shift their location. Um, what's happening is fish that prefer cold water, which we have a lot of those off our west coast, the more and more water warms, the more and more north those fish go. And when you're used to fishing out of a particular port um, where you live and where you have your boat and where you have your processors and your buyers, um, that's a real economic hardship when your fish stock all of a sudden migrates permanently north. We are seeing that problem real time in our fisheries. The, the typical a student at school to in love with this because you're obviously um, a tremendous amount of willpower and a dose of crazy <laughs> um, I would say that my first time around in grad school I went to school for the wrong thing um, my master's program at the University of Arizona was very uh, soil focused, soil and water chemistry uh, that's not totally unrelated um, it helped in terms of the basic science that I had to take. Um, but what got me into this is um, one day I registered for a class called Galapagos Marine Ecology. Thank you to my professor in the back, Richard Nankin. Uh, Some of you, I'm just going to interject here, may remember that Katrina is the first presenter for this series on ocean science. And she, and for those of you who can't see her, she's sitting over back here. So that's a big shout out yeah. for Katrina. It's a big shout out to Katrina. <laughs> um, so I took Katrina's Galapagos Marine Ecology class. I, uh, we had to design our own project. I decided, um, I remember one day we were snorkeling and she was teaching us how to take a survey of something. She was teaching us how to use underwater clipboards. And I remember I circled the bend towards me and like my heart was pounding and I was like I'm about to get my butt kicked by a sea turtle it's gonna happen this is how I go um, and then it just swims right past me its flipper hit my face and then it just went to this little bed of like algae green algae behind me started munching on it and then that exact same day one of our guides said you know we know see we know that green sea turtles eat algae but we really don't know what types you know types to target to conserve, and I was like, let me help you with that. And so my project became, um, I followed, around, I literally stalked sea turtles at seven different cove sites around the Galapagos Island, and I literally had this little underwater clipboard where I was like marking brown, red, green, and then I'd like 
poured up to Katrina on the shore, and I and I would have like if if it was shallow enough, I grabbed. Um, in federal agencies that primarily work in coastal cities, you know, it's not as ubiquitous as other government agencies. And so, I just did everything I could, because 40 hours is a long time to hate life every week, and I didn't like the job that I first got out of grad school. I was like, okay, if I'm going to hit the reset button, I may as well do it where I can still, you know, down five Red Bulls and get through exam week, you know? Um, so, I did it. I wouldn't look back on it. I do love my job. I hope that answered you. That was a long-winded answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a fabulous answer. I'm not sure if I've ever heard a better answer to that question. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. I'm looking around. I don't see any last hands. Going. So we so much appreciate you coming. Uh, to give this presentation, it was fascinating, informative, inspiring, and what a great story about how you came to where you are today. Thank you.